Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our presentation on Public Good Apps House Innovation Solutions to Feed More People. As your technology is reshaping how nonprofit organizations help people worldwide, forcing nonprofits to become nimble and creative. In this demonstration style event, four different organizations in the food sector will share their inventive solutions to feeding more people. Public Good App House events are an initiative of TechSoup's Caravan Studios. Caravan Studios works closely with nonprofits, communities, and local organizations such as libraries to design technology solutions to help nonprofits address some of their most pressing problems. So TechSoup is a fantastic organization, and I just want to introduce you to and welcome you to the TechSoup global community. We're the global network, especially for those who are new here. At TechSoup, we believe technology like smartphones, internet connectivity, training, and more have the power to serve our communities better. And today's speakers with their Tech for Good app demos will give you a taste for what this looks like in action. Here today, we have Twilio. This event is presented in partnership with Twilio.org. Twilio is a customer engagement platform with services including SMS messaging, voice calls, phone numbers, short codes, support plans, and so much more. As a special offer to the nonprofit community, Twilio.org is offering a $500 credit and ongoing discounts on Twilio products. I'm delighted to welcome Jacob Talbot, the Director of Campaigns and Product Marketing for Twilio.org. He will share more about how your nonprofit can leverage Twilio's service and sector research. Thanks so much, Nia, and thanks everyone for joining. And you're here today because of the power of technology to scale solutions to hard problems. And so let's face it, over the last few years, we've seen massive transformation in how we use technology across so many different parts of our lives, especially in the ways that we communicate. When we think about the ways we're talking with our friends, with businesses, and especially with nonprofits too. And so to everyone who's joined today, some of you may be earlier in your digital transformation journey. Some of you may be building apps yourselves to, to fuel your own programs. And I suspect that all of you are probably wondering how you can use technology to scale your work and help more people. And here at Twilio, we were wondering the exact same thing. How can organizations better leverage technology in their programs to support more people? And we saw that there was actually a ton of really rich information out there about how technology is used in a general sense across a lot of different aspects of nonprofit work. But there was actually a bit of a gap in the way that we understand how organizations are using communications to serve their constituents and their programs. And we wanted to understand how are organizations doing this today? What's working well? Where are their challenges? And so we asked. And earlier this year, we surveyed 1,500 nonprofits in the US and the UK, Canada, and 1,100 of the people that you serve to understand how you're using communications in your programs today and what's working really well, where there's some gaps. And we released our findings in a report that you can access right here with that link on twilio.org. And I want to share just two findings that really stand out to me. The first is that 89%, 89% of nonprofits said that digital communications are critical to the ways that you deliver support to people in your programs. That may be, feel pretty familiar to you these days as we're spending so much time using digital communications to engage across our life. The second thing, and this may be more of a surprise to some of you, for some of you, it might feel very familiar because there is this old tired myth the nonprofits lag the private sector when it comes to innovation and technology. And when we went out and spoke with you out in the field to understand how you're using digital communications, we found that this was not true. And in fact, nonprofits are actually leading the private sector in digital communications. 65% of the communications that each of you are, the engagement that each of you are having with, with your constituents is now happening digitally. That compares to just 55% for the private sector. So I hope that when you hear that, for many of you, it's a bit of a validation that the innovation that you are bringing to your organizations, your communities, it is there and it is meeting the needs of the people that you serve. So there are a lot more interesting insights in this report, and I encourage you to take a look to learn. And all of this innovation around digital communications and digital technology to advance program work is really exemplified by the four organizations presenting today. 
And so with that, I'd love to turn things back over to TechSoup. And like you, I can't wait to learn more about how these organizations are using technology in their programs. If you have any questions about communications and follow-up, my colleague Alex Chen and I will be here for the Q&A. But with that, I'd love to turn it back over to Nia. Thank you so much, Jacob. In today's presentation, we will have four different speakers. Rory Falvin, the program manager at Food Cloud. Elizabeth Kelly, Senior Development Manager for Include, TechSoup's partner in Ireland. John Hernandez, the Executive Director of the Nonprofit Exchange. Alex Godin, founder of Lemon Tree Foods. Let's thank them for being here with us today. First, I'd like to welcome Rory Fallon, Program Manager at Food Cloud. Based in Northwest of Ireland, Rory is an experienced program manager with the demonstrated history of working in the nonprofit sector and has a passion for reducing food waste. Always aiming to simplify operations, he looks for every opportunity to streamline and automate tasks. Today's demo is about Foodiverse. Rory will show, Twi show Twilio how Twilio helps power their virtual food bank platform and how they have integrated Twilio products to efficiently support their network of charity and community group partners. Let's welcome Rory Fallon. Hi there. Thank you very much, Nia. So my name is Rory Fallon and I am from Irish charity called Food Cloud. So Food Cloud, we have a vision where no good food goes to waste. We do that by connecting businesses who have surplus food to charities who can use that. So the problem of food waste, you may not realize what it is, it's huge. So somewhere between 33 and 40% of all the food produced in the world goes to waste. That's meanwhile, over 800 million people don't have enough to eat. And to put it into context, it's somewhere in and around 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions, which is in and around four times what the aviation industry produces. So it, it's a massive problem. Since 2013, since 2013, Food Cloud's virtual food banking platform has helped to redistribute about 150 million meals, which has helped to save about 200,000 tons of CO2 equivalent. And we've done that across four countries, reaching over 12,000 charities. And you can see on the slides here, just a few of our partners. Our main way that we help redistribute food is by our virtual food bank, which we call Foodiverse. Now, how this works is very simple. It's three simple steps. A donor, so a business, maybe a producer or a retailer will upload details of surplus food that they'll have available. That will then be sent to a connected charity or community group via either Twilio SMS or via notification. The charity or community group will then respond to say whether they can collect it or not. If they can't, we'll keep trying with further charities again, all powered by Twilio SMS or notifications. And then once a charity has responded, they'll be able to collect, they go and collect that directly from the store. So that's where the virtual food bank comes in. So by, by using this platform, we now rescue, or we facilitate the rescue, pardon me, at approximately 1 million meals a week. So that's how we use Twilio within Foodiverse, but it's not the only way we use Twilio. So we also use Twilio to power our contact center uh, via Twilio Flex, which uh, Elizabeth will actually touch on later. We are now also using another Twilio partner called Spokephone to help us with some of the back office phone systems as well. But uh, the way I wanted to speak about today was how we use Twilio Studio. So when Ireland locked down, at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in early 2020. Immediately, we saw a massive drop off in the number of charities who were available, but we needed to know how many and which ones so that we could start to, to properly redirect the food around the country. As you can imagine at the time, everyone was under pressure and it was all very stressful. It was taking our support team about 40 minutes to get a successful interaction. So using Twilio Studio, we designed, built, tested, and deployed a really simple chatbot initially, just to go out, ask our charity partners, were they open or closed? And through that, we managed to save about 400 hours of work for our team. So it's a really simple drag and drop interface. It allowed us to contact a large number of people at once, but then they could respond in their own time. And that just basically helped us to free up our team to better all the charities that remained open. Now, apologies, I actually haven't got the other slides which show all the responses coming in, but we connected it up via Google Sheet so that our support team could work through all that. And we've just used it 
multiple times since uh, to, to kind of make more and more complex chatbots in, in order to get a better idea of what our charity users need. And so that's basically how Free Cloud uses Twilio to help our vision. Thank you so much, Rory. It was wonderful to hear how Food Cloud uses Twilio to help with Foodiverse. Now let's next welcome Elizabeth Kelly. Elizabeth is the Senior Development Manager for Include, which is TechSoup's partner in Ireland. Include is an Irish nonprofit helping other nonprofits in their digitization journey. Elizabeth works with Include clients to help them see what technology can meet their needs. She has experience in both the business and nonprofit sectors, having worked as a trainer with UNICEF in Ghana and as program manager for church support in Dublin. She has worked as a documentation expert in, local, in the localization, security, and energy management industries. Before joining Include, she was Irish manager for a U.S. telecommunications company. She specializes in team management and project management. Today's demo is about Include's work with Salesforce and Twilio. Elizabeth will share how Include helped Food Cloud use Twilio and Salesforce together to drive the best practice and quality. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone, depending where you are. I'm based in Ireland, Elizabeth Kelly from Include. I'm a little bit ahead of you all, but it's great to be able to share our experiences with both Twilio and Salesforce just to enable food cloud success because in Ireland we are very conscious of all the good things that food cloud do. It's one of our best charities I think in Ireland. So just to give you a little bit about Include, we're a little unusual in the sense that we are an IT company that's also a registered Irish charity. And we are quite proud of that because what we are trying to do is make certain that Charities in Ireland and elsewhere have access to absolutely the best technology they can so that they can do their jobs as well as they can. So we're based in Dublin in Ireland. We have 25 staff and we're very proud to be partners with TechSoup. We have been for many years, but we're also partners with Salesforce and Accounts IQ. We don't just organize the donations program and the software programs. We also do solutions for Irish charities. And that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. So one of the main solutions we provide is Salesforce. And the reason we do that is it's a very good CRM and it helps charities to keep their data secure. It helps them to do good governance, which is very important. It helps them to see what resources they have and how they use them and to be able to report back on, on their use. It's very useful for volunteers. It's great for just recording donations. So we've put Salesforce into about 400 Irish charities at this point. So Food Cloud came to us back in 2019. It doesn't feel that long ago, Rory, but it is. And at that point, they really needed a great CRM because their work was expanding and they needed to be able to manage their volunteers, their donor relationships, all the food they were receiving and how it was distributed. Of course, they wanted to be accountable, as we all do, to our funders. So they needed to have excellent reporting and analysis. So the other problem that they had was that they actually also needed to have not only all of that, but they also needed to have a great call center system. We looked, first of all, could Salesforce have done it? Yes, there's a small piece of call center functionality there, but Twilio was going to be much better for their needs. So we had to find some way of taking all of the advantages of Salesforce, which was the full view of the donors and volunteers and the work they were doing and all of the food they were gathering in, and combine it with all of the great stuff that was in Twilio. So that set us with a problem because we'd never combined Salesforce and Twilio before, but this is what we did. So can you go forward then? So we partnered with an excellent partner in Ireland called Captea, and they used a special thing called Twilio Flex to develop a customized call center interface for Food Cloud. 
And this meant that we could then write what is called a REST API so that when a request came from Twilio with the caller's number, the relevant data on the caller could be sent directly into the little window from Salesforce and the food cloud staff member could then update as they were working all of the information. It was a secure channel so that only if a request received from, was received by Twilio was the information sent. And this meant that there was a huge reduction in staff time and effort and it ensured really good data quality because people were only entering the data once into a single system. There wasn't the chance that they'd forget to enter data and there wasn't the chance that the data would be incorrect because they were entering it later once they'd finished the call. So the two systems worked side by side for the staff. And it was a great partnership between ourselves and Captea to be able to do this. Could we have the? So this means that Food Cloud work within a single system when the call comes in. Food Cloud staff have the most up to date data from their CRM when they're talking to a funder or a donor or a volunteer. And it means that they can update the information and the cases directly into Salesforce as they're on the call through Twilio. And that means all their data is stored in a single place. And that's really important. So this means we solved the problem because Food Cloud has a great secure Salesforce CRM to hold its data and a great call center system thanks to Twilio. And the two work really well together. And I think the last slide is just our learnings from this is one of the big things we wanted to do for Rory was to make it easy for his staff. So we wanted to make the two apps work well together. Please make life easier for your staff as possible. They're very valuable. You need to have one single secure place for your data. So it's really important to integrate if you can. And then the third learning is always collaborate with other experts. Include wasn't a Twilio expert at all, but because we were able to partner with another Twilio partner, we were able to do the job for Rory. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. It was wonderful to hear how Food Cloud uses the power of Twilio and Salesforce to create an excellent call center and a secure place to store all of your data. So next, we will welcome John Hernandez, the executive director of the Nonprofit Exchange. John has been the executive director of the nonprofit exchange for the last seven years. A native Arizonan, his nonprofit was expanded its reach throughout Texas and the Midwest, helping nonprofits integrate technology solutions into their fundraising and mission development. Today's demo will be of help action. In this demo, John shares how help action can address emergency food accessibility for the homebound while developing a new way for communities to volunteer. Thank you so much and welcome, John. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for having me. So yes, I am the executive director for the Nonprofit Exchange. We're a 501c3 that assists other nonprofits throughout the country with technology solutions. And most of those solutions we develop with our, with our partners like Twilio and Digital Ocean. If we didn't have those two partners, we wouldn't be able to rely on the infrastructure that we have to be able to deliver quality work. Help Action emerged during COVID. We had slowly started to observe a change in how people wanted to volunteer. Right before COVID, in-demand services were a new thing with Uber, with streaming. We want our services when we, when we want them at that exact moment. But volunteering had not adapted from what we had seen to accommodate that. It's hard for volunteers to be able to now set aside a specific day and a specific block of time to be able to go and volunteer to help their community. So we want to develop a system where people could have a pulse on their community. Another issue that came up during COVID was a lot of our corporate partners were no longer allowing official volunteering groups just due to the dangers of what COVID presented at the start of the pandemic. So we needed to find a new way for people to volunteer when they wanted to, 
and also volunteer in a safe manner while still impacting their communities. The other half of help action was developed because of accessibility. We rely, this system relies 100% on Twilio to be able to deliver SMS when it's sent out and to be able to have no issues with filtering while make it engaging. A lot of people in our community who are homebound don't have smartphones. If they do, it's hard for them sometimes to use. And so we want to create a simple solution for them to be able to get the need, to be able to get the food that they need when they need it. So help action is like Uber Eats, it, but it doesn't require an app and it's very simple to use. Again, it's all text-based and we designed it around the volunteer. I want to be able to, I wanted to be able to get notifications when there was an immediate need from our pantry or from someone in need in the community at a moment's notice and be able to say, yes, I can help or no, I can help. I can't help today. From there, the text message requests are actually passed on to each ind individual volunteer, one after the other. This way we're not spamming our volunteers uh, and our volunteers are trained to recognize the importance of each text message. When they get that text message with the delivery request from the pantry or from the person in need, they know that they're the only one getting that text message at that time. And it helps create a more value for that text message when they recognize that it's coming from the help action number. So keeping it simple was the primary objective of this program. Simple text messages, simple responses, and an easy way for someone to volunteer who has a busy schedule. Again, building around the volunteer, we didn't want to annoy them. We know with our some other text messaging projects, you're sending out a few thousand text messages, and it can be it can be disappointing when you reply, "Yes, I can take on that volunteer request," but then someone else has already accepted, and so it says, "No, someone beat you to it." So that's why we want to create heavy emphasis on each text message that goes out. You're the only person getting it. It's your chance to be the hero for the day. So they have ten, about eight minutes to respond. If not, it'll proceed on to the next volunteer who's on stand. This helps us create, again, great value with our text messages. It really shows the power of a text message. Again, our volunteers are trained and we send lots of marketing to make them realize that, again, they're the only ones getting that message. They're not competing with anyone to take on that responsibility. And just again, to show how easy it is this is a sample message. This is from one of our, the largest food pantry in the El Paso region. It's a simple message and it requires a simple response. Are you able to take down the delivery? Yes or no. Once they reply yes, they get a few more details. They get a contact information for the food pantry. They get contact information for the delivery constituents. But up until then, it's just a simple yes or no question. We've also made sure that the system is very easy to use for pantries. We know pantries rely a lot on volunteers and some of those are volunteers are the ones putting in these request orders. So it's our platform is completely free and open to use for any pantry in the US. You can add your own volunteers into the system and rely on that closed network. We can help you recruit volunteers in your city to build up a city-wide network. Our goal right now is to get 500 volunteers in every major Texas city. At 500 volunteers, you create a network that isn't stressed out, that isn't speed overused, where potentially one person could volunteer once a year at that point, while relying on the rest of the network to be able to carry the load for those pantries. So one of our biggest case studies that kind of really put our automation system to the test was last year in March during the winter storm of Texas, our rope, Austin had a Iced over room, no power, no water. People were stranded in their homes. Uh, we were working in Austin, but we hadn't worked with any pantry partners yet. So we turned the system into a neighbor to neighbor assistance. People could sign up to volunteer easily, and people could put in a request for up to five grocery items that they desperately needed. We worked with a number of influencers in Austin, and overnight, we had about 600 to 700 volunteers signed up. The course of that coming weekend, we ended up doing over 200 emergency deliveries. The system worked great. It was five people in the area who had four by four capability, who knew where they could pick up emergency supplies and they would bring those supplies to those that were desperately in need. Another thing that we learned a lot about during this time was 
Our system was able to help a demographic that we had not really thought about during the initial build, which was the visually impaired. This, again, our system doesn't require an app. It does not rely heavily on the website. It relies on text. And those with, who are visually impaired have their own apps that can actually, that work already with their text messages and help them send out text messages and read text messages. So working with those existing apps, they were able to put in their food order through text message and get updates from their volunteer through text message using their existing assistance apps. So again, by keeping it simple, we were able to help a large range of demographics that we had never even thought about. If anyone is interested in signing up, it's again, a free platform. We'll help you get set up. We'll help you with training. It's helpaction.org. John, it's wonderful to hear how Help Action is a wonderful program to engage and communicate with volunteers to ensure food accessibility for the homebound. And now let us welcome Alex Godin, the founder of Lemon Tree Foods. Alex is the founder of Lemon Tree, a nonprofit that helps hungry people find free food. He started his career when he was still in high school, dropping out to raise $1 million in venture funding for his first startup. Since then, he's organized a celebrity telethon with stars like Herbie Hancock and Judd Apatow, an adult summer camp, and the internet's premier destination for hand-painted oil paintings of emojis. Today's demo will be at the Lemon Tree Food Helpline. The majority of hungry people don't access the free food available to them at food pantries. The Lemon Tree Food Helpline connects them to the resources in their backyard. Thank you so much and join me in welcoming Alex. Hi, nice to meet you all. I moved four days ago. And so thanks to the intimacy of Zoom, you can see all of my possessions in boxes behind me. But today I'm excited to tell you about Lemon Tree, where we connect hungry. Yep. Go back. We connect hungry people to free food. This work was born out of a project that my team did in response to the COVID pandemic, where we saw that food pantries and soup kitchens were in desperate need of volunteers here in the New York City area. So we wound up actually recruiting 30,000 hours of volunteer service for these organizations. But in the, progress, in the process, we started getting these text messages from our volunteers. Text messages like this saying, if I volunteer, can you give me food? Which was so striking to us because we knew that there were more food pantries in the U.S. than McDonald's and that those places had plenty of food. And yet at the same time, we were hearing from folks who were saying, I'm going to, folks who were not only cash poor, but time poor, saying I'm willing to do manual labor to be able to get access to this food, which made no sense to us. And as we dug in, we learned this heartbreaking statistic that the vast majority, the vast majority of hungry people don't access the free food available to them at soup kitchens and food pantries. And we're curious people. We said, why is this happening? Why aren't people accessing the free food that's out there? And it starts with a data problem. We're really good at Google. And yet I couldn't find information on the hours and location of the food pantries near me. And once you find that information, you don't know what to expect when you get there. And then the second problem is even more pernicious. It's a problem of stigma and shame. Marketing for food pantries and emergency food in this country are focused on donors, people trying to give money. So they amplify the need. They say only the poorest people go and get food. People, there's, people are starving. And that makes people feel horrible. And so we hear all the time from folks who tell us that they're hungry and then say, oh, a food pantry is not for me. That's for people who are struggling more. When these folks are saying, I don't have enough food to feed my family, to put dinner on the table for my kids. And so at Lemon Tree, we solve both these problems, the data problem and the stigma problem. And so our product combines two key pieces. The first is it the best data set on the hours and location and experience at emergency food locations. And the second is world-class hospitality. We say the people we serve deserve to be treated like humans and deserve to be seen and accepted and to acknowledge that their situation is really hard. And so 
our app works via text message. And the first thing we do is greet people as humans. We say, hey, we're a real person here to help you. And then we follow that text message up with actionable information on places in their backyard where they can find places like St. Joseph's on Fulton Street. And if you Googled hard enough, you might find this food pantry. But what you wouldn't find is that they're only open one hour a week. You need to live in their zip code and you need to bring an ID. We hear all the time from people who, before Lemon Tree, took a bus across town to get to a food pantry only to be met by closed doors or only to find out that they needed a piece of documentation that they didn't have, which is why we are laser focused on having up-to-date information on every single resource. And our secret weapon in that work is surprisingly novel, asking people how their experience was. We say, you went to this food pantry? How was it? How long did you wait? What did you get? And that information helps us help the next person and the next person. And we're not just getting data. We're also getting pictures like this every single day of food that we've unlocked for folks in their backyard. And the really cool thing is that we're doing that more and growing just really fast. In 2020, we helped 1,500 people. 2021, we helped 15,000 people. And in 2022, we're on track to continue that type of growth. And it's important because there's a lot of people who need this help. And we started right here in my backyard in Brooklyn, and we're in, we expanded to the five boroughs of Manhattan, five boroughs of New York City and then to Philadelphia and Northern New Jersey. And now we're gearing up to go to every single major city on the East Coast of the United States, and then to the broader United States as a whole, because it deserves access to this, and we're excited to bring it to them. So that's Lemon Tree. Thank you for your time and excited to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Alex. It was really interesting to hear about your work in helping hungry people throughout my hometown of New York City easily access food. And I look forward to see more about Lemon Tree spreading throughout the East Coast. Now it's time to head over to the Q&A section. So this first question is for John. How do you differ from Catch a Fire or Volunteer Match? A bit of difference is Rather than getting volunteer opportunities that might be ongoing, this is more of an on-demand service. These are volunteer opportunities that need to be done within the next 24 hours. So there's a little bit more emphasis on them. They're volunteer platforms. It's about matching you with specific missions, with specific jobs. This is, hey, there's a winter storm. People don't have access to food. Hey, there's someone that's stuck at home because of COVID and they have no family in the area. This pantry needs to get them food. This is immediate on-demand needs. And again, it's for the for volunteers who have a busy lifestyle, who can't set aside specific time to search for volunteer opportunities. This is stuff where they can sign up and immediately start. Thank you so much. So our next question is for Rory. So Rory, what is an easy way for someone to reduce their food waste at home? So we always say that the simplest way is to write a shopping list and it's a silly little thing, but it is genuinely the simplest way. So before you go food shopping, make a list of kind of what you're going to have to eat that week and then write down what you need and also what you have. If you don't have time to write down what you have, you can take a quick photo of your fridge, of your shelves, and you'll be able to see what you have so that you don't end up buying more than you need basically, because it's tend, we tend to be taken in by a lot of the special offers where something can seem very cheap, but if you're not going to use it, was it really that cheap to begin with if you end up throwing it in the bin? Alex, the next question is for you. When do you expect to launch a lemon tree throughout the Northeast and what will be your first city outside of New York? It's all a bit up in the air, but we're working really quickly to... Every there's so much need across the country for this. And that the same stats that we see about two thirds of the folks experiencing hunger, not accessing food pantries, holds from New York City all the way across the country to Bozeman, Montana or San Francisco. And so we're constantly working on finding places where we have really strong community partners who can help us on the data side, 
alongside a really strong need for the service. So always planning and uh, sprinting towards that goal, but nothing that we can share just yet. And John, I have another question for you. Is there a cost to using Help Action? No, the platform is grant funded and it's also funded by our own initiatives of earned income, but it's completely free to any pantry in the U.S. And I have a question for all of our panelists. Is there an interest in extending some of these solutions that you have discussed today outside of the U.S. market, for example, in South Africa? Just to say, Include is working in Ireland, but we have had... We have done work outside the Irish context, and we would always be very interested in looking into that context as well. As somebody who worked in Ghana for a few years with UNICEF, I would have a particular passion if the possibility arrived for us to be able to do that. Yeah, and I suppose on from our perspective, we recently received funding from the Irish government to investigate whether our solution would make sense. And we're looking at four African countries in particular. I actually think Elizabeth Ghana might be on that list. Uh, as part of that, we do work in Central Europe already and we are absolutely open to other locations too. Great. So we have a question from John. This would be for Alex. We are currently using Twilio in a mobile preparedness app. Is there someone that we can speak to in regards to expanding our Twilio use case among our app user base? Yeah, absolutely. So you can reach out to your account team. If you don't have an account team, you can definitely go through our Impact Access program and you'll probably get connected to me and we can have a chat about how we can expand those use cases. And Linda wanted to know, and this is a question for all the panelists, are you noticing a trend for more people growing food locally? She in particular is worried about the amount of food coming out of California due to the doubt and the drought in Lake Mead. So just interested in hearing some of your insights on growing food locally. Again, from an Irish context, we have a, a great partner in Ireland called GIY, which is Grow It Yourself. And there is definitely a large push throughout the country for people to, to start growing as much food as they can, really. Now, obviously, the climate of Ireland only suits certain types of food, but everyone can grow something no matter where they are, even if they've only got a balcony, if they're in an apartment or a big, if they have a big back garden, obviously they can grow a lot more. But yeah, GIY is a great organization we have here who are really pushing that. Another question submitted by someone anonymously. What do you do to get feedback on the solutions that you have created? Do you reach out directly to the people that you serve? Happy to answer that. Yeah, that's what we do. We ask people, we say, how is your experience? And we do that on a level for each of the food pantries. There were soup kitchens, whatever resources we're for referring someone to. And we're learning this place isn't the best place to send someone. And if you're looking for food in bed we can not just tell you which of the five food, where the five food pantries are and what their hours are. We can tell you which ones are going to give out fresh produce, which one has the shortest line, which one is really the best place for you to take your time and go and get food. Your second question was about like getting feedback on our service. And we do that too. Whenever we have a question, we just had a question today about our user funnel and about how likely people are to click a certain link in a text message to make sure that we're as active as possible. And the next step is we're going to schedule phone calls with our users and say, how is your, how is, how did you do this? And why did you do it that way? And really from a, a, everything we do starts with the client, started with people coming to us and saying, Hey, I need food. And we said, okay, how do we help you with that? And then we said, and the first version of that was literally my phone number and my co-founder's phone number taped on telephone poles. And people would call that phone number and I would pick up and they'd say, oh, I need food. I'd say, what's your address? Write it down. I'd say, what's your phone number? I said, I'll call you back later. And I would just go to Google because we wanted to learn as quickly as possible about what was out there. And part of that is really about listening to clients and what they need. If clients aren't telling us that they need any uh, clients aren't telling us that they need diapers, we're not going to go and research diaper beds. If folks tell us that diapers are their top priority, then we're going to make sure that we have the best data in the world on diapers. So we're always listening to folks and using that data to, to build out our product. I was wondering if you would be able to share a little bit more about Twilio's impact program. The way that and Twilio thinks about providing support to organizations like all of you tuning in today is really threefold. First, there's our team, folks like Alex and, and our specialists for our nonprofit program are here to provide strategic guidance, ensure that you have the right technical support or connect you with a partner. 
if you have questions about building with Twilio. So that's the first part. It's our team here to support all of you. Uh, the second is the, the product piece, and that really is that impact access program that you heard about earlier. And if you go over to um, TechSoup, you can sign up in just a few minutes, and that provides a $500 Kickstart credit, which in terms of text messages, which we've talked a bit about today, that's about 80,000 text messages. If you're here in the US, there's some differences in prices around the world, but think of it as about 80,000 text messages and the discounts across all of the Twilio platform. So whichever services you might be looking for. So that's the product piece. And the third piece is through the Impact Fund, we provide grant support to organizations, organizations who are building and scaling solutions. Many of the exciting things you heard about today, we look for instances where organizations can really scale their impact through technology. And we invest in those organizations to help them serve more people. So those are the three different ways that we provide support to organizations through Twilio.org. So much. And so one final question for all of our panelists, if there's one takeaway that you would like for our participants to take away from this session, what would it be and why? We can start with Rory. That's a great one. Honestly, volunteer, I think is the best one. Someone needs your help. And I would just find who that person is and see, can you help them? Elizabeth? I think it is be kind to your staff. Think of ways that you can help your staff so that they can help more people. I think that's really important. I say that the big theme is build. I'm just so impressed by the creativity that all the organizations brought today to creating solutions that are really customized to the needs of the communities that they're serving. So encourage everyone to put on their builder hat, think about creative ways they can approach problems too. John? Volunteers are still uh, a nonprofit's biggest strength, and we just have to be ready to adapt to their our, our ever-changing culture, which is now more on-demand services, shorter attention spans, and utilizing the best communication tools that we can. Alex? Be a human. That there are so many, the way that we think about this, there's just, like, we can use technology to make things more efficient. We can, we should, and we need to. But we shouldn't forget about being human beings and listening to folks, speaking to them as humans and treating, working in at a human level. And so I think that magic happens when you combine that human piece and that, that tech piece. Thank you so much. And join me in thanking our panelists for their time and generosity.